Hello, welcome to this A3 webinar series. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar, Robots and Beyond Roundtable, How Women in Robotics and Automation Are Changing Manufacturing. My name is Danielle Capriato. I'm the Digital Marketing Manager for the Association for Advancing Automation, and I'll be serving as your moderator today. Attendees viewing this webinar are in listen-only mode, which means that you are muted. If you have questions during the webinar, please submit them in the question panel at the right of your screen. We will try to address as many questions as we can at the end of the program, but if your question is not addressed during this webinar, we can respond via email. And this webinar will be recorded and a link will be sent to you within the next 24 hours to watch it on demand. This webinar series has been brought to you by the Association for Advancing Automation, also known as A3. A3 is the leading automation trade association in the world for robotics, vision and imaging, motion control and motors, and industrial artificial technologies, artificial intelligence technologies. We are your hub for all of your automation resources from products, partners, new applications, trainings, and information on all the latest technologies and innovations. Visit automate.org to learn more. I would like to thank our exclusive sponsor for today's webinar. Fictive is the digital infrastructure for custom manufacturing that makes it faster, easier, and more efficient to source and supply mechanical parts. Its intelligent workflow automation supported by best-in-class operations talent orchestrates a network of highly vetted and managed partners around the globe for fast, high-quality manufacturing from quote to delivery. To date, Fictive has manufactured more than 20 million parts for early-stage companies and large enterprises alike helping them innovate with agility and get products to market faster. And I would like to introduce our moderator for today's webinar. Your moderator is Joanne Moretti, the Chief Revenue Officer for Fictive. Welcome, Joanne. Thank you so much, Danielle. Thank you uh, for having us here and, and thank you to uh, A3. Uh, we're just thrilled to be here today. Um, we're especially proud to sponsor this sort of special webinar dedicated to highlighting and supporting robotics um, and the automation industries, but specifically celebrating successful women uh, in this industry. Um, I'm, as you mentioned, I'm Joanne Moretti, the Chief Revenue Officer at Fictive, and I get to support these women every day in their respective organizations. And we do that, as you mentioned, by simplifying sourcing for them during their NPD cycles so that uh, they get productivity and speed to market. We have invited some superstar women here today uh, in this industry. And our goal is to really help the audience understand what some of the exciting trends and opportunities and drivers are in this industry, but also to help our audience understand how they've personally managed through this really evolving and dynamic um, landscape of, of robotics and automation and how they manage you know, this fast pace uh, within their career and, 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 and the industry around them. So I'm, I'm pretty, uh, again, uh, excited to uh, share uh, and have them share their insights and knowledge. And I'll start with introductions. So I'll start with Andra. K. Uh, Andra is the managing director of Silicon Valley Robotics, and she's just involved in a number of things. I got to work with Andra and uh, Silicon Valley Robotics back when I was at Jabil, and, and uh, we hosted a few sessions there at the Blue Sky Center. Andra is the managing director there, and uh, Silicon Valley Robotics is a nonprofit uh, industry association and uh, founded by advanced robotics companies really to let the rest of the world know what's going on in robotics and keep everybody sort of up to date um, and innovating constantly. She's an experienced strategist. She speaks globally at events uh, about the investments and the impacts of robotics overall. So really, really happy to have Andra on our panel. Jackie Ram is the VP of Operations at IAM Robotics. IAM Robotics, uh, Jackie joins with such a solid manufacturing, product development, supply chain, engineering background. I mean, she comes with the whole package. She spent 30 years at Fortune 500 companies like Jabil and Esterline Technologies, um, and she's done some incredible engineered solutions around UAVs, satellites, energy, lighting, aerospace and defense. I mean, she's seen so much uh, in her in her uh, experience, and it's really exciting to have her on this panel. 
Jessica Moran comes from Berkshire Gray. She's the senior vice president and general manager there. And she's got such a proven track record in business and understanding really what the needs of customers and markets are and then bringing solutions to market. Um, and it's having an incredible um, you know, opportunity at Berkshire Gray bringing uh, great customers and, and solutions together there. So we're really excited. Uh, to hear more from Jessica and she'll bring that business perspective to the table. Um, Michael Taylor is the Principal Technical Program Manager at Amazon Robotics. Michael has spent two decades making useful robots um, from a robotic senior sort of prom date to an autonomous underwater vehicles to cutting edge industrial robotic systems. She's really put her hands on many, many different programs um, and applied robotics and uh, all of the automation technologies and capabilities that Amazon brings to bear uh, in her career. So pretty excited to have this panel with this diverse background and, uh, and all these different perspectives. So what I'll do is, you know, I want to make this very conversational, ladies. I want you to jump in and feel free to add any color. I'll ask specific questions to, to you know, a variety of you. And then again, if you want to just jump in with any thoughts or any other ideas or just add to, please, please make this conversational and, and engaging. All right, so if we go to the next slide and, and just kind of uh, get to the meat of the questions, what I'd really like to do for this first question is go to each person and really uh, help us understand your company, your company's perspective, what your vision is and what your mission is. What are, what's the real value you're bringing to your customers and your markets? So let's start with, uh, uh, let's start with Jackie and let's uh, talk about what uh, Jackie's company, IAM Robotics does. Sounds great, thank you very much. Joanne, thank you very much uh, to this uh, esteemed panel as well in A3. So I'm here at IM Robotics, and as Joanne had mentioned, as the VP of Operations, they've been around for about 10 years. In fact, they're going to be uh, celebrating their 10-year anniversary in October. And essentially, they've been in the material, robotic material handling space, uh, autonomous mobile robots, essentially bringing goods from point A to point B. I joined this year as a result of a strategic pivot. They're focusing on a brand new product that's going to be bringing to, brought to the market in, in early 2023. And essentially the mission at IM Robotics is to help companies work more efficiently in their warehouses, specifically in the area of order fulfillment, to shorten the, the, the click to customer cycle time, which we believe is, is the greatest influence on the supply chain. Thanks, Jackie, that's great. Jessica. Great, thanks Joanne, thanks uh, for having me. Um, so at Berkshire Gray, we're um, hyper-focused on driving transformative change. Um, we use AI-enabled robotic automation for supply chain fulfillment. Um, our products, our systems, our identification, picking, sortation, and mobile. And at Berkshire Gray, I get to uh, lead efforts working with some of our strategic customers, um, FedEx, Walmart, and uh, Target, to name some of the key ones. That's great. Michael. Thank you, Joanne. Very cool to be here. Um, so yes, I work for Amazon. I, I think most people know what Amazon's mission is, um, but I specifically work in the global robotics organization and the kind of core of that organization and the part that I work for directly is Amazon Robotics, what used to be Kiva Systems here in the Boston area. And so our bread and butter is really the Kiva system um, that, that was originally developed here, which is the fulfillment system with the yellow shelves, and little orange robots running around. Um, but since then, uh, Global Robotics has expanded into bringing manipulation technology, autonomous mobile robotics, and other, other kinds of robotics and automation into the fulfillment network. Um, so we're constantly pushing, trying to find the new stuff that we can bring in. That's wonderful. Andra. Well, thank you, Joanne. It's wonderful listening to what the other panelists are doing. And you gave a really great introduction before, but I do think one of the great pleasures of being a robotics industry association is getting to hear these stories. You know, what's better than one robot company? Being able to listen and learn to hundreds of robot companies. And we have seen exponential growth in the robotics field just in the last decade and that brings its own challenges we 
focus very much on trying to understand what challenges the robotics ecosystem has, each individual company, and what are the big problems across the robotics ecosystem. How can we, as an industry association, make change that makes it easier both for the robotics companies and for the adopters of robotics technology and for the people working with robots, whether they're making robots or utilizing robots or working alongside as so many people are starting to do now. It might not be in your job description, but there's a really good chance that you're going to end up working alongside a robot soon. Very good. Thank you, Andrew. That's a great overview. Um, let's go to the uh, let's go to the next question because you you've actually brought up uh, or led us right into that that question nicely. What are the trends that you're all seeing sort of in this industry? It's going fast, and obviously, fast brings its own level of complexity and issues, but. What, what, I've listed some, but give us some, your perspectives, and we'll start with Andra, just to kind of finish some of the thoughts that you were uh, hitting on, but what, what are you seeing, especially in Silicon Valley? I mean, uh, is the funding there? Is there M&A starting to happen more and more and consolidation happening? What are some of the key things you're seeing? That's a really good point because what we're seeing now is definitely different to what we were seeing five years ago and definitely different to what we were seeing 10 years ago. And rapid change simply in the last two years, as I'm sure everybody recognizes, the pandemic shifted the demand for robotics forward by 10 years across the board, across every industry. And so in the last decade, we've gone from focusing on getting investment into robotics, which was sub millions, to now 35 billion, probably globally. We're seeing equal percentage of startups across the world now, but many, many more older startups, shall we say. They're still startups, but we're seeing consolidation, we're seeing mergers and acquisitions seeing some IPOs that slowed down and now the focus really is on the things that the pandemic has exacerbated talent shortages across the board and supply chain problems how do we make these robots and how do we get these robots out into the workplaces that they need to be in right right good prescription Jessica what are you seeing I mean you're in the huge you know business development side of things and things are shifting fast yeah i mean i i um completely agree with andre's comments i think that the pandemic has created a new normal for us all right so um i don't know anybody who learned how to buy groceries as an example online during the pandemic who has now gone back to spending two hours a week in the grocery store right and so because of that um that those supply chain needs are um uh, have obviously been maxed out. Um, I think customers' expectations have been um, elevated even more. And I think um, from an execution perspective, the pressure on organizations to be able to deliver and execute and do what they say that they're going to do is even more, um, there's even more of that than ever before. And at the same point, you have this kind of inflection of uh, people wanting to do things faster, faster, faster. And so how do you make sure that you um, maintain the quality and the delivery and the execution at the same time that you're able to deliver faster? And so to do that, some organizations, um, Andra mentioned, of course, the mergers and acquisitions. I also think partnerships, right? If you don't have end-to-end -end capabilities in your solutions, as, as some do and some don't, and some just want to amplify, um, you know, we saw this in, we've seen this in software, we saw it in FinTech, right, co opetition and it's been much more, I think there's much more partnerships, many more partnerships that are happening now, and that will continue to happen as we go forward. So the ecosystems are really maturing. I think so. Yeah, yeah exactly. Jackie, what are you seeing as far as trends and, and, and even drivers? So it's interesting, uh, I uh, mirror the comments that both Andra and Jessica made. I know right now that 
the key, what I believe to productivity is essentially automation. I know that we're just at the beginning of what could be and what looks like a hockey stick, double digit growth uh, in this particular market. I think, uh, especially working at Jabil, uh, a contract manufacturer that prided itself on uh, the most efficient method of manufacturing at the lowest cost. Uh, automation was something that I focused on as a business unit director. And I know certainly as now a, a provider of ro robotics and automation, industrial automation, as I'd like to call it, our focus is, is to do exactly the same thing, create the efficiencies that, that folks are looking for to meet the expectations that, that are now on the landscape. So I believe adoption now is, is one of the major areas where people are now opening up that that window of, of thought because it's now, it, it's either sink or swim. It's You have to adopt if you're going to stay competitive, I believe. That's, that, that's exactly right. Michael, how are you feeling about this pressure to move fast and then innovation and then sort of the, the tools and the uh, solutions out there to help you move faster? Do you think that uh, ecosystem is there and uh, do you believe you, you know you're you're because you all move very fast and you're going from one thing to another and and so how do how does that work and and uh, do you feel like all that part of the ecosystem is there to support robotics manufacturing and, and getting things to market quickly I mean I, I think the supply chain is definitely inhibiting that a little bit um, just because especially these are hardware systems right and you can't build hardware without components um, and, and I think across the industry, you know, in the, the groups I'm in of people working in robotics, there's a lot of, ah, has anybody been able to find these? What about this? What about this camera for years, years now? Um, and so I, I think that, you know, there's a catch 22 of automation can help provide resiliency to the supply chain. Um, but also we need the automation to get built and we need to solve the supply chain problems before that can happen. So I, I think that's something that, that will be interesting to watch over the next year or so. And I do want to highlight that point. I think resiliency, you know, we talk a lot about the, the productivity gains that automation brings, but I think if, if there's anything the last couple of years have shown us, it's how, um, how fragile all of our supply chains and logistics networks were just around the world. And I think the interest in onshoring a lot of that now, um, pulling that back here to the US and, and more domestically anywhere, um, that's that's really interesting too, above and beyond the peer productivity, so. Thank you, good stuff. Hey, Danielle, we can move forward because this leads us right into this sort of um, uh, next slide, thanks. So what? So this leads us right into this: is is what are you seeing as sort of the barriers to adoption of robotics in general, as far as your end customers are concerned, with slowing them down in terms of adopting, um, and then what's driving the adoption faster? What What are the two sides of that coin? Jackie, why don't you start? Well, I think there's no doubt, especially as a business owner working previously for a company that needed to, to essentially buy automation or build automation into the process, it's cost. There's no question about that. And I don't believe that there was the good, uh, what I call interoperability or scalability, be able to take a couple of components, make it work as a system in a way that it could create those efficiencies without having tremendous amount of maintenance and administration. I think the next uh, barrier to um, adoption is, is just simply just the, what I would call the, the just the whole process of, of capitalization and managing that. And I think on the flip side of it, the manufacturers are now looking at ways of offering RAVs or robots as a service. So this way they can expense, they can trial it, they can look at the specific use cases. And then as they get a little bit more into it, they get a little bit more comfortable, they see that these robots can in fact manage the types of, of work that they'd like for the robots to do, then the level of confidence goes up, they go out for funding again, and voila, you've got sort of a, a what I call it, a set of funds that are that are cyclical, that are they're helping fuel this adoption. But again, I believe the, the adoption is is more of a, just simply it, to address the, the lack of, of the labor pool. I mean, we use direct labor to make robots and unfortunately that direct labor is also the same direct labor that, that goes into picking uh, and, and or fulfillment. And so at this point, it's the labor shortage that I believe is driving the adoption, at least from, from my vantage point. But remember, I'm just a manufacturing person. I've been in supply chain and manufacturing for 40 years. So for me, it is, it's more about being able to produce the goods that we need to deliver to the customer when it's all said and done. That's right, that's right. But I think you're right. I think that labor shortage is 
is just a huge driver. Um, you know, bringing everything back to the U.S. is a good idea in theory. Uh, where's the labor? And and we're running out of labor in other even low cost countries, right? In Mexico and in other places, there's just not even enough labor. So I think that that's definitely a big driver. And then there's a whole aging sort of workforce that's that's happening and dynamic that's happening. So yeah, I, I can see labor um, and and those types of issues uh, driving that. And at the same time, it's creating all kinds of new opportunities. I mean, what are you seeing there in terms of, let's talk about that for a second from a career perspective. What are some of the cool opportunities that it's driving from a career perspective? Michael, can you talk about that from a, an Amazon perspective? Yeah, so I mean, the the good news in robotics is more robots, more things to fix, right? So I think that there's, a, there's an entire, uh, uh, career path um, that Amazon actually helps train people for where you can move into robotic maintenance, robotic technician kind of work, um, because that, you know, and, and it's even beyond the robots, right? It's any kind of automation. Robotics is just one part of the spectrum of automation and all of the conveyance, all of the material handling systems, all of that requires love and attention from people. Um, and so there, there's a lot there. I think that the systems integration world, I feel like is going to blow up soon too, right? As there's more robotic products out there, figuring out how to integrate them into the workflows, how to integrate them into the warehouse management systems and how to build a system that works for um, what you need it to do that isn't just shoehorned in. Um, you know, systems integrators have always been around, but I feel like they're really about to have their moment. Uh, that's a really good point. Jessica, are you seeing that? Are you seeing that, you know, partnering and systems integrators and putting the pieces together are really important to your customers as far as adopting and driving things forward? Absolutely. And I, I think it does play right back into that partnering discussion, right? So you have all these robotics organizations, you need somebody to help go in and, and define what the, or design what it's going to look like, and then pull the pieces together and, and do that work. And so I do think that there's a huge opportunity in that system integrator space. That's great. And Andra, yeah. how about, I mean, these evolving ecosystems again, as far as partnering and what, what interesting partnerships are you seeing? Well, I'll just start with a couple of points from the adoption barriers and the the points that Michael was making as well. We're finding that reliability is really what people are expecting when they're the the end users, the customers for technology. And Jackie pointed out the incredibly um, well, it's business innovation that a lot of these technology innovation companies are bringing to bear to de-risk the process of adopting an innovative technology. You're just renting it or you're only paying for the results. For example, um, before Kindred was acquired uh, by Ocado, they were doing picking for the gap and they charged per successful pick. Hmm. So. Their reputation, right? Pay by the drink. Yes. So you weren't paying for the time, the effort, the number of picks yeah. it were attempted, only for what was the customer's end goal. And you know, I I encourage startups to always think about that a lot. Don't go out there and sell the shovel. Your customer wants the hole. And indeed that I've seen even in construction robotics companies saying, well, you know, we, we're not renting them the uh, autonomous um, crane or dozer, we're selling them a hole. And that is the literal uh, start of that saying. So I do think that touching on what Michael said though, this myth that you only, the only jobs that robots are creating you're going to need a PhD for is so wrong. Every single possible job that you can have is potentially a part of the robotics industry. Yeah. We need the website design. We need the sales teams. We need ops managers. We need HR. We need everything to grow a robotics company. So you know, my message all the time is that everybody can be working in robotics 
and you're probably going to be working alongside robotics as well, but it's not a job thief and the jobs will be available for everybody. And I love the efforts that some companies are making to, to bring people into the workforce at every level, because I certainly hear the need for technicians, for maintenance, for the job of robot wrangler, the person that goes and gets it out of the corner it got stuck in, just yeah. accompanying robots around. I think every robot out there is creating so many jobs. And it, 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 it's against the sort of the, the, the common sort of misnomer that it's taking jobs away. In fact, it's creating jobs. Right. right. We can't get enough people yeah. to take up these jobs that we're creating. Stuff. All right, let's move forward in the slides. And I think we covered the, yeah, we talked about that. Um, so let's move forward one more, Danielle. All right, so let's shift to kind of uh, working as, as women. And uh, some of the, you know, obviously we have tons of pressure on us uh, in so many different directions. And this is a fast moving career, fast moving industry. How do we manage this? And, and uh, what kind of coaching can we give others uh, as far as, uh, you know, for years we've been outnumbered in some of these industrial and high tech uh, industries. Um, so how do we manage? And I'll, t I'll start with Jessica. Um, I think that, uh, let me, I think that there's a lot of different things that we can do. I think everybody's got to find their own group, but I think for myself, the number one thing that I, um, found particularly when I became a mom was um, just drawing my own lines, right? You, you're not, you can't count on anybody else to say, hey, you know, take this time or um, don't lean in too hard on this or don't put too many hours on, on that. You have to be able to say, here's where my lines are and I have to work around it, make sure that I'm delivering or exceeding expectations all the time. But um, if I need to, you know, shut down for a couple hours at five o'clock so that I can feed my kids dinner and, and, you know, get them to soccer practice and that's what I need to do and, you know, jump on later on when they're, when they're tucked in bed. So uh, I know it's just one data point, but that's kind of what I've found has been the most successful for myself. That's right. That's right. And you're traveling and you're doing so many different, are you back on the road? I, I have been a lot this month. Yes, for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm hearing. It's it's uh, it's back on the road and uh, back to the uh, pre sort of COVID pace, if you will, almost. Jackie, For what sure. about you? How are you uh, finding sort of that balance? Just just work life. Uh, kids or no kids? Like, how do you how do you manage just having a peace of mind and and you know shutting off for a bit if you need to? So I agree with, with Jessica's comment, you have to have basically some boundaries, but I think more importantly, you just have to set goals for yourself, goals for your team, and you have to focus on also self-help because I'll be the last person to say that that's what I did 20 or 30 years ago. I mean, I've been in manufacturing 40 years and, and I took two weeks off when I had my daughter. She's 28 years old and she was a computer science undergraduate, a master's in computer science. And she definitely takes that, that work-life balance very seriously because she recognizes uh, how independent I was as, as a mother. But I think more importantly, she recognizes just the simple fact that, that now, if she doesn't do that, it's gonna compromise where she is in her, in her own career. But I guess my point, when it's all said and done, it's really hard to have a career in robotics because it really isn't 24 seven, 365, especially for somebody like me, I, I manage uh, logistics as well as field service. So we're on all the time. When a customer calls a, a bot's down, then uh, you're on, that's it. And you just have to find ways to, to take care of yourself in those downtimes. That's right. That's right. And draw those lines like Jessica talked about. Michael, how do you do it? I just do what men have always done and I marry a very supportive spouse. Um, no, I, I, I think, um, and he can hear me, so, you know, props to him. Um, so uh, I, I think that um, some of it is is finding the right place to be that will be supportive of the life that you want to manage for yourself. Um, I think some of it too is um, creating that environment uh, for yourself and for other people, especially as you kind of move up through the ranks uh, throughout your career, when suddenly one day you find yourself like, oh my gosh, I'm the role model now. And, and taking the opportunity to normalize things for yourself and other people, whether that's 
when you're on vacation, you don't check your email in Slack or when you um, go on parental leave, you actually take the leave and you don't say, you know what, you can, you can call me, it's, it's fine, right? And, and by drawing those boundaries to yourself publicly, that also helps set it up for other people. So it becomes the expectation rather than the exception. Um, and and I've, I've seen that happening. Um, I, I have been trying to do it. I've seen coworkers of mine trying to do it. And frankly, it, it helps people of all genders, right? I've had men reach out to me and be like, I am so glad you just ran that entire design review with your kid on your lap. It makes me feel like it's okay for my kid to show up in my camera view. Like it is, it is okay, right? And, and, and I think that when we take these opportunities to normalize that behavior, it helps everyone. Yeah. Good stuff, thank you. Andrew, what are you seeing and how are you managing? Because you're involved in so many things globally and uh, how do you do it? Well, I am old enough so that all of my children are college age or older. And I do not believe that it would have been possible to be doing what I am doing now when my children were younger. And that really does suck. I am so impressed by the techniques that younger women are teaching me for being more assertive about this balance. And it isn't, you know, as, as has been said, it isn't just about the work-life balance for women. Although we always seem to focus the discussion that way, I like seeing some younger men start to take it seriously and be really active parents and include that as part of their conversation around the workplace. And I think, I really hope that we have allies on this call as well, because that is a major part of being an ally for the women in the workplace, is yeah. to normalize the work-life career balances for every person. And to, to say that, yes, having a family is a beautiful responsibility that might make it difficult for you to, to come straight back to work when you've just given birth or your partner has just given birth. There, you know, every person has their own, their own challenges in their work-life balance. And I'll just finish that with saying it also varies, not just on what stage your family or you know, what is happening in your life balance, but also what stage of the work career you are in. And the thing that I have learned more recently is the, the danger for women in their early stage career, in their first 10 to 15 years, smart, successful young women taking on far too much in order to prove themselves when they see things going wrong, they're stepping in and they're becoming managers when it's not in their job description. And that can have real negative impact, particularly in something where you have very specific metrics. For example, programming. And you're measured on your lines of code. You're measured on the deliverable for you individually. You are not being measured on the deliverable for your team. So stepping in and saving your team all the time might seem like an obvious thing. It might seem like a way to prove yourself, but it can backfire in terms of your career. So it's like, don't take on extra unless you know it's going to be a good career move for you as well. You know, this, this wanting to solve every problem and be superwoman is you don't need to be superwoman. Yeah, that, that's so true. And it's all about choices, right? It's the choices that we make. And I agree. I think, I think we, as a, you know, as women kind of, you know, have always felt that urge or that need to prove ourselves and go that extra, extra step. And uh, it just puts so much pressure and breaks other things. So good, good, good point. All right. Well, we are. Uh, how are we doing on time, Danielle? Do we have time for? Okay, great. All right. So this yeah, is there's, the final. there's plenty of time for this question. Okay, good stuff. Good stuff. Um, in that case, I, I want to sneak one more question in. 
uh, about being a woman in this particular industry and or high tech, because I know some of you have spanned multiple industries, are you still feeling any kind of ceiling? Um, and maybe not necessarily the company that you're with, but are you still seeing it around? Um, and 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 how how does it manifest? And and uh, how how are you feeling? And what are you seeing? Or is it getting better? Andrew, let's start with you. It is getting better, but the pace at which it's improving, it's a little bit like the wage gap. It's not going fast enough to really be useful. So we need more assertion, more opportunities. We need to make sure that the scales on which we're being weighed and what we are providing come out equal because very frequently women get measured by different criteria. And these unconscious biases can just slip in everywhere. So one of the things I tell founders is um, we know through research that male founders get asked about the opportunities they have in front of them and female founders get asked about the problems they have in front of them. Hmm. You have to be a politician and answer the questions you want to answer. So you start with that, say, we have ways of dealing with all those problems, are happy to talk about that, but this is the opportunity that I see. So it's almost, again, startup wisdom is know your exit strategy. My career has been kind of accidental all the way along my path, and I've tended to create the jobs that I have ended up with. They didn't exist until I started doing something and then that became my job. Um, so I don't have any traditional kind of career wisdom barring what I wish I had told myself was learn about being a leader. Learn about being a manager as well because I've accidentally carved out my entire career really. And I believe that a lot of women do not get the leadership training and guidance that many young men are receiving. Now, as we get more women into the workplace, then I believe that women tend to be more open about mentoring and bringing others up with them. But it's a blind spot right now, and there are not enough senior women to mentor all of the younger women that we're trying to bring into the field. So you have to go out and find mentorship where and when. This is where our allies become very important. And you have to look at your own set of strengths and weaknesses and say, well, have I had any kind of leadership training or orientation in my schooling? If you play team sport, actually. Yeah. You and you must help too, I think. Jackie, how, how do you feel about that? And, and do you feel like there's still ceilings and, and or are you, you know, trying to break those and offering mentorship and guidance and, and how do you help in this case? Thank you for asking me. I actually uh, was one of two women in engineering school when I graduated in the early 80s. And every job that I ever had first was a process engineer or manufacturing manager all the way up to a business director. I don't want to say that I was the first, but I was one of the first. And so there's no question that the, what I would call the, the glass ceiling still does exist. It doesn't exist in every organization, but as, as Audra had said, the, Andrew had said, the, the challenge is where you are in your career versus what the organization is and, and how you, you look at that. So all along the way, I've always had interns. I've had, uh, I've offered mentorships. Uh, I've tried to, to tell uh, women how to manage their way through certain situations. And at the end of the day, it's, it's, um, it still exists. And as Andrew had also said about the, the pay, the pay still is not quite equal. I know for certain that we continue to try to open all opportunities for everyone, especially here at IM Robotics. We have uh, 26 women on a staff of um, 90 people. We have two non-binary uh, individuals as well. So when I look at uh, diversity and inclusion, it is something that most organizations, especially large public institutions, are focusing on 25% by 2025. And 
And I know for us, we don't even think about that statistic. We just look at the skill set. We look at, at what experience they can bring to the party. And then we just look at the opportunity. If we had, we would actually have more women on staff if, if we had more applicants. And so when I think about where I've come from to where I am today, yeah, it's a very different um, road today than it once was for other folks that, that are individuals uh, in, in this decade, so-called the 21st century. But you know, at the end of the day, you just have to pick your choice. If, if you don't like where you are, you just gotta go move and do something else. And so I always encourage people to reach out on LinkedIn, to reach out and, and uh, ask for um, any sort of advice. If I have any nuggets that I can pass along, I'm always happy to spend the time. And, and I do take the time uh, to always offer that advice because they don't teach you how to uh, communicate in school. They don't teach you how to manage a budget. They don't teach you all the functional parts of, of an organization. And so when they question me, I say, yeah, if you got the time, I got the time. Now that's really what it's all about is, is I've stood on other giants uh, shoulders previously. So now it's my turn to be here and, and sort of be that, I don't want to call it servant leadership, but just offer the opportunity for people to engage if they're interested. That's outstanding. Thanks, Jackie. And I've witnessed that for myself. Jessica, what are you seeing that way? And, and how are you breaking that down? Yeah, so um, I think uh, one point that Jackie started on and one point that Andra started on that I just want to highlight, which um, uh, my words for what Jackie was saying was culture. I think when, when you look for the place that you want to spend your next step of your career, really taking the time to really lean in and talk to people and talk to people that are either there or that have been there or that know that people are there to leverage the hell out of your network. I mean, it really does matter. And I think that I have um, seen people, myself included, maybe rush through something in the past and know kind of right away that it's not the right thing and and make changes as a result of that. But I think really focusing on the culture is really important um, and do do the work um, to, to make sure that you know it. I think the other piece um, is the mentoring piece that was brought up. And when I look at mentor mentoring and um, those that have mentored me, but certainly those that I'm mentoring, I try to focus equally um, on both men and women because I think it's really important that we're coaching men that we're all equals, right? And so the best way to do that is to be establishing, I think, credibility and, and trust and, um, and relationships with folks you know, regardless of, of sex or sexual orientation or, or identification. And so I think that it's really important that we are coaching and mentoring the, the women that, that are on our teams or in our organizations or in our networks, but also men equally. Um, and then the last point I would just make is, um, uh, is kids, 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 right? Like we STEM programs at schools getting our, I think what I've seen since I've been in robotics, um, it's been two and a half years, always in, in technology my whole life, but robotics the last two and a half years is not, um, it's it's incredibly uh, equal the way that I have been treated and that I've seen women be treated. There's just not enough women in the pool. And so us going back and, and working with, um, with programs to get more young, girls in STEM programs to get more young girls in programs at school that are going to lead to engineering degrees and and everything that leads to the technical piece of robotics, not the business piece, because I'm a business guy, not a, a technical guy. And so you can have kind of any degree you need to on that side. But the technical piece of robotics, I think, is really important. And encouraging and filling the pipelines because they're Correct. just not there. There's such a gap as far as the talent, you know, a talent gap that we need. Uh, in this industry, but in so many others. Michael, what are you seeing? And, and do you, or have you felt that ceiling and have you broken through it? And, and um, how are you helping to support, you know, filling those pipelines? Are there any interesting things that you're doing? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the ceiling is is there. It's it's being, you know, there, there, are, there are chips in it for sure. Um, I think the the thing I see more often now is, and I, and I think this is a generational thing, it just is where I'm positioned generation, generationally in the industry, is that the women who are senior above me, there's like one or two. And 
it's still sort of a referendum on all women, whether if they if they succeed or they don't succeed in that role, right? Whereas, you know, kind of below me, you know, generationally, it, there's a lot of women, right? And some are amazing at their jobs and some are okay at their jobs. And that's that's okay. You don't really see that kind of at the, there, there's, there's no mediocre women allowed yet. Um, in, in the upper echelons. And I think, you know, ironically, that's the day we'll have really arrived, right? When, when there's a mediocre woman in a position of power and that's okay. Um, but um, so, so I think, you know, that, that it's, it's still, you know, it's, it's, it's a pyramid right now. There's very few women at the top and it, there's still a lot of pressure on that. And there's, there's um, it's a tough, it's a tough role, I think, for those women to be in. Um, I think that, um, you know, mentorship is is really valuable. Um, I, I do I do mentoring when I can. I think the other thing I try to do is really build community, um, because I think you know coming out of college, I went to a college. It was it was all engineering and it was you know gender balance between men and women. Um, but even so, I didn't really have a, a strong network of women coming out of it because I was I was one of the guys. That was my coping mechanism for for engineering. And um, when I finally did build that network of women. Uh, professionally, it, it was a huge for me and, and a huge support. And so I've tried to foster that um, in companies I work for, on the programs that I run, um, you know, among the alumni of my school, we have a really active group of um, just underrepresented minorities, um, gender minorities um, in, in engineering. And, you know, it's sharing salary information and sanity checking, like, is this weird or is this okay? And, and just all that stuff, just the, that sounding board and that support network is so valuable. That is so valuable. Thank you. Love all those perspectives. So here's the final question before we go into kind of Q and A. Um, when you look at your career um, and all the amazing things that all of you have done, what what would you say to your 21 year old self? What what major nugget, major learning have you had that you would say, hey, 21 year old self, make sure you what is what is that advice you would give, Andra? Let's start with you. Network, and that's why we created Women in Robotics to be a professional network for women who, and non-binary people, yes. who were working in robotics or who were interested in working in robotics. And when you are in a great organization like I Am Robotics, and you have a supportive culture and you have a network of other women already, okay, that's great. But many of us were that one person or we were dealing with a culture that was not as supportive and right. we realized that we didn't always even know that those other companies with good cultures were out there we didn't know what what to expect we didn't necessarily know that we were in a bad place until we discovered what a good place was supposed to be like and this comes with the networking and you know when you think networking um it, it's a little bit more about being strategic about it. It was really important for me to establish a network of other women and to be able to, to reality check experiences. And do and, your homework, like Jessica said, right? Yeah, absolutely. And we've been running a mentoring program as well because that's one of the things that the women were asking for. So I, I'm really pleased to see that happening and it's a bit of a way of trying to provide some of the advice that I would want to give my 21 year old self today. Good stuff, thank you. Jackie. So I've actually been wearing safety shoes since I got out of college. <laughs> uh, I started actually as a panel operator in a manufacturing facility that made printed circuit boards. And at the time, Safety shoes just weren't that great, but now they do have lovely like cheetah print safety <laughs> shoes, you know? So uh, what I would say um, is buy and wear better shoes, find your tribe. So what does that mean? It doesn't necessarily have to all be women, but people that can support you. So this way, you know that what you're doing, in some cases you're pioneering as a woman, especially in robotics and and uh, just find your tribe, find people that that can prop you up and and, and help you as you continue on with with your quest but i think the most important thing is have confidence in yourself have confidence in your skills your education and and allow yourself the opportunity to fail fail often and then regroup and and continue to find whatever it is that that's whether it's the culture or the place that you want to be in your career 
because you may wind up in a very, very different place than where you started. That's excellent. Thank you, Justin, Jackie. Jessica. Um, so for me, I would, um, I agree with everything that, that um, Jackie and Andra had mentioned. I also would say, don't be silently efficient. So I think as women, we're, um, we're very likely to just get shit done and not maybe raise awareness about it. And I think, you know, not being silently efficient, finding my voice and um, advocating for myself. If I learned that when I was 21 years old, or if I leaned into that when I was 21 years old, I just wonder how much my path would have changed. I love my path, but I, I just wonder, could, could there have been yeah. maybe slightly, slightly more path? Slightly different. Yeah, exactly. I like that. Michael. Uh, I think I would tell myself to appreciate the failures. Um, I, I think that, you know, I, I'm happy with where I've ended up. I have no regrets about how I got here. But I think in the thick of things, you know, when a job was incredibly frustrating and would have me in tears, or when I was trying to start a company and we ran out of our seed funding when I was seven months pregnant, that was not great. You know, that was a really hard time. But But like all of it, all of it was so valuable in figuring out what I wanted, what I didn't want, what would be successful, what would not be successful. And, and the learning opportunities of those have been so important for me. Um, but, you know, it's hard to maintain that perspective, like I said, when you're in the thick of it, so, yeah. Very good. Yeah, I feel so many of those same things that you, you, you've all mentioned great points. And I, I feel like, yeah, I've gone home some days and thrown myself against the wall crying and been so hard on myself uh, where I could have got with a tribe or a network um, and, uh, and, and really, uh, you know, got the advice. So definitely that's at the top of my list is, is leveraged more and more sort of mentors in the process. Uh, I do today, but boy, I, I do wish I had uh, back then. So I, I feel, feel that way as well. Um, all right, well, let's, we have, I think we have a question or two, um, but let's move into questions. So Danielle, I don't know if you have, I can't see the question. Yes, I have, I have the questions. Um, we have a few, we might not have time to get to all of them, but let's start the question from Mike Schellenberger. As an educator, I would like to hear thoughts on recruiting or inviting young women into a robotics program. Anybody want to take that one? Rhett and Jackie, go ahead. So I know I am Robotics is at the University of Pittsburgh this week on a recruiting tour. Uh, we are also at Penn State uh, at the end of the week. Next week we're at Worcester Polytechnic because we're looking for embedded engineers, software engineers. Uh, we're looking for computer science majors. We're looking for anybody that's interested in learning about robotics. So I think really focusing on, especially from a people ops perspective, uh, if if you need talent go seek it yeah yeah it's not always going to come to you go find it because there's lots of opportunities out there so good one anybody else like to weigh in yeah michael i, I just something that i see a lot because i'm involved in you know a number of outreach programs to universities and high schools is um i and this is kind of a two-way street if you if you have if you have the people you're training right make sure they understand that CS is not the only path into robotics, right? We need mechanical engineers, we need electrical engineers, we need product managers, we need user experience designers, we need supply chain experts, we need so many things. And if you don't like coding, that's okay. We got lots of other stuff for you to do. Um, and then simultaneously on the other side, you know, I think often tech companies writ large put overemphasis on CS as the path into tech. Um, and I think we don't do enough to point out all the other different areas that we do need people to be trained and to have that technical bent but not necessarily the technical expertise. So I think companies could do a better job of that too. That's a great point. That is so similar to what uh, was brought up earlier. That's a great point. Anyone else on that particular question or what else have we got, Danielle? We have one other question um, from John Raymond. It says, first of all, thanks for the conversation. Um, and then his question is, speaking of STEM and youth, are there any companies or organizations really killing it? And who went out there in your minds breaking down the barrier of entry into robotics? There has been a huge amount of growth in STEM opportunities for younger women. 
I have been tracking this over the last 10 years, and uh, certainly when we do the Women in Robotics Photo Challenge, we found that the number of photos of young women doing robotics was much greater than it was, say, 10 years ago. And indeed, where there's a lack is professional women doing robotics, doing hands-on involvement with robots. And so we have a bit of a focus on providing the professional inspiration because it's not just the pipeline, it's the pond. If you don't make robotics look like an attractive career, then getting kids excited about robot competitions isn't going to translate to ongoing careers in robotics. But you ask who's killing it? I have to say that robot competitions in schools or in youth groups or they seem to be just about everywhere and they get they get youth of all genders very excited about robotics. It's amazing. I also think um, I also think that there's organizations like the United Way that work really closely. Um, I know they sponsor a Boston um, STEM. I don't know if it's a week or a month. It's in October, um, and we actually partnered with them at Berkshire Gray last year to use um, our robots to pick STEM learning kits for uh, 2,000 Boston public school kids um, with tools and and materials that they could use. So. I think that um, that there's organizations out there also that are really trying to get out to more and more kids, regardless of of who they are or where they live, and and teach them about STEM and and the good the goodness of what that could look like for them. That's great. Anybody else have thoughts on that? We are right about at the end of time, but I do want to call out a question from Heidi Sedek. Um, Heidi, I hope I said your name correctly. She says she's a 36-year-old woman and she's just starting in the field of robotics and automation. Do you have any advice for her since she feels she is too late already? We don't have a ton of time, um, so I will hopefully, you ladies are willing to share some thoughts with you with her out via email later, but if anybody wants to touch on that really quick before we close. Join the Women in Robotics class. Yes, join the Women in Robotics community uh, network with other women. And we need more career transitions into robotics. I said at the start, we do not have enough adult women in this field. And we need, everybody is desperately short of people across the spectrum of potential jobs. So don't ever rule yourself out of robotics. Rule yourself in to robotics. Don't be intimidated, you got this. Yeah, exactly. Jessica, you started in robotics like- I, I was just trying to count how many years, uh, yeah, how old I am. So I started at like 46, six, five, something like that, right? So I'm definitely not a roboticist. I'm more of a business dev person, but it, it is intimidating, but don't be intimidated. It's awesome and fun and changing all the time and nothing but opportunity. That's right. That's right. That's very cool. All right. I think On that's that a wrap, note, Danielle. Yeah, thank you so much to our panel. Um, Joanne, thank you for moderating. So happy to have you all. Um, as we close, join A3 tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern for our next webinar sponsored by Intel. The convergence of connectivity and compute unleashes intelligence at the industrial edge. This will be a panel discussion covering 5G, edge to cloud, and how to effectively derive value from your data. Learn more and register for free at automate.org forward slash webinars. I hope you found this webinar to be interesting and informative. If you have any questions about the Association for Advancing Automation or today's webinar, please reach out to the Fictive team or myself via the contact information you see on the screen. As a reminder, this webinar has been recorded and an email with a link to the recording will be sent to you within 24 hours. Thanks again to Joanne Reddy and for moderating and assembling this amazing panel. All of our panelists, thank you for participating. Fictive, thank you for your sponsorship and all of our listeners, thank you for your support. I hope you all stay safe and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you all. Thanks thank so you. much, ladies.